The Lord is the strength of his people and the protector of the salvation of his anointed. Words taken from today's introit, the entrance antiphon, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. On July 16th in the year 1251 AD, the superior of the Carmelite order, namely St. Simon Stock, complained to the Mother of God of all the persecutions waged against his Carmelite order from enemies, enemies within the membership of the church. St. Simon Stock begged the Virgin Mary to come to the aid of her special order in order that it would not be suppressed. Do not forsake us, he cried out. Do not forget us, for the Carmelites are under your mantle and under your powerful protection. Again, the plea of St. Simon Stock. And the Most Holy Virgin herself then appeared to Simon. She presented him with the brown scapular and said the following, quote, My son, receive this scapular as a sign of the privilege which I have obtained for thee and for the children of Carmel. Whosoever shall die invested with this habit shall be preserved from the fire of hell. It is a sign of salvation, a safeguard against peril, the special pledge of peace and protection, unquote. The saint, full of joy, showed the precious gift he had received not only for the Carmelite order, but also for the entire Christian world. Now, by wearing the scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, we are clothed with Mary's garment. And thanks to our little brown habit, wherever we are, whatever we are doing, Mary never sees us without seeing upon our bodies evidence of our devotion to her. Always and everywhere, our scapulars plead for her for our protection, rather, and for our salvation, while also telling Our Lady that we love her. But know that if we have generously offered Our Lady public and continual homage through the wearing of the brown scapular, she will never be outdone in generosity, but will guarantee us protection and, yes, salvation. She will protect us in danger. She will help us to die well. She will quickly and powerfully help us even after death if we dwell in purgatory. If Mary protects us, whom shall we fear? If Our Lady crushed the head of Satan himself, then she can certainly protect us from the attacks of the demons. Therefore, our brown scapulars are a sign and a guarantee of salvation, for Mary will never fail us. There is no doubt that her kindness towards those who wear the brown scapular will ensure that they will receive the last sacraments, that they will be given the grace of true contrition for their sins, that they will avoid the fullness of divine wrath if they are clothed with her garment and die with Mary's holy habit upon their bodies. Again, we hear her words. The Virgin's solemn, unbreakable promise and guarantee, whosoever shall die invested with this habit shall not undergo the torments of hell. It is a sign of salvation, safeguard against peril, the special pledge of peace and protection, unquote. Now when we think of Mount Carmel and the Holy Land, we think of the prophet Elias, and we are familiar with that most serious contest between the Lord God of Israel and the false god Baal. Mount Carmel was a place of decision, a location where a choice was made. Now in the Old Testament, the prophet Elias summoned all Israel to come to Mount Carmel to witness a contest between the true God, Yahweh, and the false god Baal, between the prophet of the Most High, Elias, and the 450 false prophets of a false god. And the people of God, Israel, would have to choose one or the other, Yahweh or Baal, the city of God or the city of man. Choose life or death, heaven or hell, but make a choice. 
Elias turned towards Israel and cried out, How long will you straddle the issue? How long will you sit on the fence? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. But the people of Israel, the Bible tells us, did not answer Elias. They did not choose. Not at that moment. And so Elias called for two young bulls to be cut up and placed upon two altars. One altar dedicated to Yahweh and another false altar to the false god Baal. And the contest was that the god who sent fire down from heaven to consume the offering, the bull, the God who caused his own whole burnt holocaust, he would be declared the one true God. And Israel answered, agreed. Well, the false prophets began. They offered their worthless prayers and no one answered, for no one was listening. But with just one prayer from the lips of the prophet Elias, The Most High sent down fire and consumed the entire offering and the altar itself. And seeing this divine holocaust, the people fell prostrate and said, The Lord is God. The Lord is God. That holy location known as Mount Carmel would remain a place of prayer, even mystical prayer. As holy men, after the example of their spiritual father, Elias, lived, worked, and sang God's praises on on those holy heights. These were those early hermits, those religious men, those men of Carmel, who prefigured the full establishment of the Carmelite order. And due to their fidelity, their prayerfulness, these men of Carmel were open to the preaching and message of the coming Messiah as preached by St. John the Baptist who came in the spirit of their founder, Elias. These same men of Mount Carmel were also baptized. They were baptized with the baptism of John. In addition, the town of Nazareth was near to Mount Carmel. It is said, in fact, that upon returning from their flight into Egypt, the Holy Family stayed in a cave on Mount Carmel and conversed with the spiritual sons of Elias for several days. And furthermore, it is said that during the time that Our Lady lived in Nazareth, she would delight in visiting the foot of the mountain to speak with the hermits and instruct them in the mysteries of the faith and the rule of perfection. And with this preparation, The spiritual sons of Elias were ready to join in the mission of spreading the message of the gospel and distributing the fruits of redemption. And on that day of Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday, these men of Mount Carmel were present. They were present when the apostles spoke in tongues and began to perform miracles in the name of our dearest Lord. They believed the gospel of Christ and were the first after the apostles to have a most tender affection for Our Lady, whom they had the joy of literally seeing and knowing. And they united themselves with the apostles. They began to preach in Judea and Samaria. And yes, on Mount Carmel, the spiritual sons of Elias erected a small chapel in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary. This was undoubtedly along with the shrine of Our Lady of the Pillar, built by St. James. These are the first churches ever dedicated to Our Lady. And there, the spiritual sons of Elias gathered each day, a chapel that they built in honor of the Mother of God. They gathered each day there to pray. And so true to their founder, St. Elias, these religious men built the chapel to Our Lady on the very spot where Elias cast himself down and prayed for an end to the drought that had resulted from Israel's infidelity. And from that spot on Mount Carmel, the Bible tells us Elias and his servant saw a small cloud arise over the sea and brought down rain in abundance. How appropriate a spot for the first Marian shrine of all, for she is the cloud which moves at the slightest breath of the Holy Ghost. And like a cloud, she brings us the rain of divine grace and ends the drought of sin. 
Now, these holy men came to this chapel of Our Lady every day. And in their sacred ceremonies, their prayers and praises, they honored the most blessed virgin as the particular guardian of their congregation. She was their protector. And for this reason, they came to be everywhere called the Brethren of the Blessed Mary of Mount Carmel. And along with the apostles, they were the first to practice true devotion to Mary. And Our Lady returned the favor. She returned the favor, for she saw this community of men as her community, and she would provide for her community's protection. And obviously that protection was eventually seen under the form of the holy brown scapular, which again she delivered personally to St. Simon Stock. But Our Lady would show her guardianship even more. You see, the Carmelite order in the Middle Ages came under suspicion, as did a number of mendicant begging order of friars. In fact, the Carmelites faced outright suppression. The various enemies of the Carmelites within the church, they influenced Honorius III, the Pope at that time, to destroy the Carmelite charism and the community. And to put an end to this most serious threat, the most gracious Virgin Mary, the protector of Carmel, appeared by night to Pope Honorius and commanded him, commanded him, mind you, to show kindness to her order and to the men of her religious community. The Virgin stated the following. These are her words. Quote, My orders to you, Honorius, She's ordering the Pope. My orders to you, Honorius, do not admit of contradiction or any delay. Don't contradict my orders. Don't delay, Honorius. She continued, speaking to the Pope, quote, so that you might have faith in my words, know that your judges, who are the enemies of my religious order, that are about to suppress it, they will feel the vengeance of God this very night, and they will die simultaneously a sudden death, unquote. The Holy Virgin spoke these powerful and uncompromising words in a vision to Pope Honorius III in the year 1226 AD, ordering him to approve and protect the rule of the Carmelite order that is the order of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the very next day, Honorius III learned of the deaths of the judges and enemies of the Carmelites, whom the Pope had chosen to judge in the case regarding the approval or the suppression of the Carmelite order. The Pope then called the Carmelite religious to appear before him, embraced them warmly, and proceeded to compose a papal document which confirmed their rule. The institution was definitively approved. And the sons of Mount Carmel gave thanks upon learning of this prodigy and the extraordinary protection of the Virgin Mary over their order. And the remembrance of this event was perpetuated by a feast instituted by the same pontiff at the request of St. Simon Stock, who was then vicar general of the Carmelites in the entire West. This is part of the solemn feast day of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, recorded in the liturgical calendar as July 16th. As a final note, we remember here July 16th, the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel with great fondness. It is the very anniversary of our Latin Mass personal parish. The same date also marks the last apparition of our Blessed Mother to St. Bernadette of Lourdes. During these times, when threats to tradition are growing and various works and apostolates of tradition are being literally suppressed before our eyes, we, like St. Simon Stock and all the men of Carmel, turn to Our Lady and we ask for her protection. And in return, we promise to show her true devotion beginning with our grotto. 
despite all the setbacks, all the delays, all the attacks, we are protected by the Blessed Mother, omnipotent in her intercessory powers. And I would like to think that we, too, are her special parish. And I would like to think that the community that staffs this parish is her special community. Let us trust in these words, therefore, and realize that tradition will gain victory and that our grotto will be built. Whosoever shall die, invested with this habit, shall be preserved from the fire of hell. It is a sign of salvation, a safeguard against peril, the special pledge of peace and protection. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.